Hey everybody, welcome to LinuxCast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm Drew. All right, and as you might have noticed once again, I feel like a broken record. There's no Tyler here. I'm going to start saying progressively worse things about Tyler until he shows up. No, I won't do that. But Tyler is not here. He forgot. This time he literally said he forgot about us. So that's what I, I miss mean, that that's, guy so much. At this point, I don't even remember what he looks like. What's his name again? I don't even know. He hasn't been here in a month. It's... I mean, usually I cancel at least once a month, but we've been doing really well on keeping a streak going. And he's just not here. It's okay. Tyler is young. He's gotten a life and no longer has time for his Linux friends. I, I, I say the same thing every week. But it's apparently true. Tyler, as Drew said, we miss you. Come, Come back, back to, to us. us. <laughs> Dump the girlfriend and get back. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, Tyler's cans. No. Also, if he'd let us know today, we would have invited Josh on because Josh has been asking to come on the pod again. Oh, man. But literally, we didn't know until after we were here. So, Josh, don't at me. This is Blame Tyler. So, anyways, there we go. No Tyler, but this is the Linux cast. We talk about Linuxy things. And we're going to be doing something a little bit different this week. Uh, and we'll do this every once in a while where we collect a... Uh, a group of links that are all news related all somewhat FOSS related and we'll talk about them for an hour or so we'll see if we get to all six of them i don't know if we will probably uh, we'll see but anyways that's what we'll do and like i said we won't do this every week because there's just not enough news to cover around and just to also we didn't it had to be recent recent ish something within the last few months so it's not breaking news this isn't cnn if you're expecting CNN, you should go watch CNN or Fox News or whatever. But anyways, that's what we're planning to do. But before we jump in, yeah, we will we will go ahead and jump into our week in Foster. Drew, what have you been up to this week? This past week, I don't know if any of you have heard, Bet, there was a hurricane that just blew by Florida. I was actually doing the podcast last Tuesday, but the effects of that hurricane making landfall hundreds of miles from here, but... The Tampa Bay area, which is where I live, had significant storm surge. And I've been helping some folks out, mostly family members with cleanup. My house in particular had no damage. We did have some power surges, but comparatively, we are incredibly blessed. I just want to put that out there. Very blessed. Like most people, I have more than one computer. And strangely, my computer that was sitting dormant for a very long time there's a reason, but not a good reason. <laughs> I've been modifying my workspace and now I'm on the big daddy. I got to say, I should have done this a long time ago. And yeah, I'm an idiot. Uh, I did spend time watching the Bucks. Sorry, Matt, against Matt's Eagles. Boo hiss. And now they are in first place in the NFC South. And I'm going to Atlanta a day after tomorrow for the game there. Should be a good time. About a week, well, a week ago, Matt and I delved considerably into Nextcloud. And I've been obsessed ever since. I have uploaded my first video on the subject. It's going to be a multi-parter, probably. It is not live yet. My documentation for this 45-minute video is available on justaguylinux.com. I don't have the thumbnail or the description uh, in the in the show notes yet, but hopefully tonight, maybe I'll have it out. 45 minutes, basically, of how to install Nextcloud on a Ubuntu server, not using Snap, not using Docker containers, anything, just straight on a Ubuntu server. And uh, that's what I've been doing for the... And by the way, the documentation on that, long time, took a long time to do, but... I feel very accomplished in doing that. So there you go. Okay, so first off, I'm really looking forward to that video, uh, even though I wouldn't probably install outside of the Docker c container because I'm a Docker nut. But just watching that stuff is, you know, my kind of thing. I still watch every Debian install video that you that you do, and <laughs> I found myself disappointed that there hasn't been one recently. Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like maybe we I, could I, rectify that because like, you know what's <laughs> funny is i think i have i have documentation on how to do Nextcloud on a debian server but i just thought this was more in terms of um, using the ubuntu server even though I'm, i might lose my debian status or something i thought that that was probably a more real world 
type of solution than using the Debian server. So that was my my thought at least. That makes sense. But yeah, I don't. It's a, it's the. I have something weird with those type of videos. It, 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 I see it's like, like some YouTubers like, oh, I installed Gen 2 or I installed Debian or I installed Arch or whatever. I'll click on it and watch it. Like I've installed those things hundreds of times, but I'll still go watch it just because, I don't know, I'm a nerd. <laughs> can't help it. It's just, it's fun. It's, it's my version of a cat video. I can't, it's great. Anyways, all right, so me, I have been... Slacking. So last week I talked about how busy work was, and this week I decided that I wasn't going to pull all the weight at work. So I decided I was going to slack off a little bit. It's fine. Um, I'm not going to get fired or anything. But I decided today that I was, I really, or I said it was yesterday, I really wanted to go back to a window manager. Like I've been talking about this for ages and ages that I wanted to go back to a window manager. And because I was so attached to Wayland, I kept, every time I tried to go back to a window manager, it was always Hyperland. And I get into Hyperland and it would be buggy. Like it's just buggy. And I can't I don't think that it's Hyperland's fault. I think it's because of a weird combination of hardware that I have. So I don't wanna I don't wanna push too much blame on there because Katie has problems in Wayland on my hardware as well. But so I don't wanna blame too much on Way on Hyperland, but needless to say, I can never go back to Hyperland because it's just always so buggy. So I decided if I'm gonna actually make it into a window manager, I'm gonna have to do an XORG window manager, which means going Back to Xorg, which is not something that I actually thought I'd do because I actually kind of got attached to uh, Wayland while I was using it because, it, you know, no screen tearing. It worked really well with having different resolutions and all that stuff, right? But I get, I gave all this stuff up, went back to an Xorg window manager. I went back to i3, and I have to say, Drew, I, I'm i so happy here. Like, I can't, like, I knew I missed a window manager. Like, I knew I did because you... I couldn't shut up about going back to a wind manager. Everybody was like, just go back to a wind manager. You keep talking about it. Just do it. <laughs> I finally did it. And it's even worse than that. I, like, I really missed it. Like, this has been a spectacular couple of days where I just, like I told Drew before we started recording, I'm really rusty at this stuff. Like, I used to be really good at Polybar. I used to be really good at, you know, doing the, the configuration and stuff. It's taken me a while to get back into it remember how to do stuff. And that it's kind of been like relearning how to do something, and that has been extraordinarily fun. Frustrating at times when things didn't turn out the way that I wanted them to to do, but that's just the kind of the way that it goes. But yeah, I it's been so entertaining to figure out how to you know I've written a couple scripts so I can put some new stuff in the bar. That's cool. I went through and, and fixed it so that all the bar the bars appear on all three monitors. I've done all this stuff, and it's just been so fun. And I'll probably stay some time in i3. Uh, you know, i3 at one point was my favorite window manager of all time, and I can see why. It's just so good. And I actually have a script that makes me, it allows me to use workspaces like Qtile and Xmonad, where they'll kind of swap spaces when I want to, when depending on what monitors in focus. So that's cool. So it worked. The workspaces work the way that I want them to work. So it's worked really well. But I probably will just because. Again, I'm a nerd, and I want to revisit some of my old favorites. I'll probably try BSPWM. I'll probably go through and patch the hell out of DWM just for fun again. That that's actually kind of sounded fun. Uh, I'll probably try Xmonad because it's been you know I, I've been you know I have issues with Haskell, but I I eventually learned to like that. I'll probably try Awesome again because you know why not? So <laughs> I I have cool things to do. You guys are gonna be hearing about window managers for me forever. But it's gonna be like three years ago back when. <laughs> I started the channel. It's going to be awesome. So that's basically all I've been doing is messing around with Window Manager. The only other thing that I want to say is that I tried, I attempted this week to switch to a different web browser. So I tried to go to, to Zen Browser. Based on Firefox, open source, developers doing pretty good work there in terms of making it look cool, has a lot of cool features. But they put in workspaces. And that's one of the reasons why I was able to switch is because workspaces are a really important feature for me because I have a ton of tabs and I'm always doing things and managing tabs that way with Vivaldi. The problem is that the way Zen Browser does workspaces is really fucking stupid. And I think I'm okay saying that because it is dumb. So the way workspaces are supposed to work is just, you know, a workspace is just a collection of tabs that are hidden when it's not in focus. And you can put that in one window or two windows or whatever. And if you say, for example, I have two windows of Vivaldi open, I can have one workspace in one window, one workspace in the other window. That's the way you'd expect a workspace to work, right? Well, in Zen, 
the workspaces are window specific. And when I say that so I can have all my workspaces in one window, open up another window, while the workspaces are there, the tabs that are inside of the workspaces are not there. And I was like, that has to be a bug, right? So I filed an issue on GitHub and the developer or someone who was contributing there said, oh, that's the way it's supposed to work. And I was like, huh? That's silly. Anyway, so that was the end of me switching to a different browser because that's just not going to work because I have, it's a silly workflow, I know. But right now, so just for example, right now, I have probably four instances of Vivaldi open. I have one for the, the Jitsi call that's in its own workspace. I have my main one, which is where all, you know I spend most of my time. And then I have another one that has all my social stuff in it. You know, the Discord and Mastodon and stuff, all that stuff are in separate workspaces in separate windows. And it's easy to switch back and forth between them. But Zen doesn't let me do that. So there goes my attempt to go to an open source browser. It's disappointing. So anyways. So I got to ask, I mean, is the, how's your memory, your muscle memory? There we go. Muscle memory with uh, using key cords and stuff. It's better today than it was yesterday. Okay. Because it was, it was really bad, but also one thing that's not helping. So, you know, I bought that really weird keyboard, right? The, the split yeah, keyboard, yeah. the dactyl, yeah. right? The problem is that the way that it's laid out is there's not a good place for the super key. The super key is always for everyone on the left-hand side and the bottom row. On my left-hand side and the bottom row, I have the up and down keys, and I have control and alt. There's there's only four keys there. There's no place for me really to put the Windows key the, or the super key, right? So when I was in Plasma or in Gnome or whatever, it was perfectly fine for me to put the super key on the, le the right-hand thumb cluster. It worked fine because I didn't use the super key all that often. Most of my work was done with the mouse. Now it's really weird because now I have to use the my right hand to press the super key and then the left hand to do whatever else it is that I want. Yeah, that would be a little weird, I think. I've gotten yeah. somewhat used to it, but I, I'm still so you can I can use a, an app called Vile to program this keyboard. And I can basically move any key wherever I want. Plus, there's some features. There's something called, I think it's called Tap Dance, that basically allows me to control what the keys do when they're held a certain amount of time or pressed a certain number of times. So if I wanted to make a double key, a double tap of a key, do something, you can do that. So I've experimented a little with moving the Windows key over to the left-hand thumb cluster. But that the thumb cluster has three keys, and... It has shift and space and enter, which are my probably my three most used keys. And when I switch the Windows key over there on tap dance as like, like a, a long hold, it messed so many things up. Like I'm sure I probably could have got used to it, but it was just a, kind of a mess. So right now I'm kind of probably going to just stay here, but I'll keep thinking about it. I, I'm not sure... It's weird. I have I have so many keys. What I could do, I suppose, it really mess up my typing. But I could get rid of the function row at the top completely, move everything up a level, and then I'd be able to have like the bottom main row all empty, and I could move the Windows key anywhere there. But that would I finally got to the point where I'm like at 80 words per minute on this thing. I don't want to move things around so much, so I don't know if you know moving around would it probably be really hard i don't know anyways that that's my that's been my biggest problem is that super key being on the wrong side and trying to figure out where everything is and, and then also remembering so i created a whole bunch of key cords back in the day when i was using yeah, i3 remember. and stuff yeah. right and i don't remember any of them <laughs> like i had no clue what any of Didn't them you have were. like a super s and then something else and then yeah it was yeah. yeah, yeah, I have Super S. I have Super R, which is gets to my writing scripts. I have okay. a, a couple for uh, like at launching applications like GIMP and, and Audacity and stuff like that. I still don't know what those are. I think it's Super G something. <laughs> don't, don't know what any of those other ones are. I'll figure it out eventually and get it kind of rememorized. But honestly, the, the key binding that's messing with my head right now the most is the one that I use for Rofi. So for years, I've used Super D for Rofi. Yeah. And because that used to be a one-handed operation, now it's two. Now in Plasma, I oh. use K Runner, and I switched that to Super M. So I might do that here to get to Rofi, 
but I also have Super M as a scratch pad, so I, I don't know. It, it's it's going to take me some getting used to. But it, this whole thing, this whole situation, it's been just been fun to kind of get back into this stuff and trying to figure it out and stuff. So for those of you in the chat that want to install a window manager, just go to my GitHub. <laughs> There is a script that will install not just vanilla, but a custom install for awesome BSPWM, DK, DWM, Fluxbox, i3, IceWM, Openbox, and Qtile. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> oh, it's definitely. It's just too bad it doesn't work on a real distro. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> All right. I, I deserve that one from the uh, from the Eagles comment. I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah, I can't defend the Eagles, Drew. I just... <laughs> I just can't. It was so bad. The Bucks were good, right? They, but yeah. I, I don't know that they're as good as they looked against the Eagles because the Eagles were just that bad. So yeah. just lower the size of your head a little no, bit. No, 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 no. <laughs> Listen, uh, yeah. We're, we may get torn in, in Atlanta this week. So I don't know. We'll see. All right. Anyways, you guys don't need to come here to Drew and I could no, talk about the Linux whole podcast. I thought. We could talk about football the whole time. You want to know what? If Tyler would show up, we'd be able to stay on topic. That's not anywhere close to being true. Yep. <laughs> I said it. Didn't even believe it. All right. Anyways, let's go ahead and move on to the main topics this week. So we have a collection of news articles that we've chosen. So we'll just do one and kind of switch back and forth between them, Drew. I'll let you go first. So you choose which one you want to go first, want to do first. I'm just going to go top to bottom, I think, in our notes. For mine, for mine, I have Linux Mint 20, uh, sorry, 22.1.1 is set for release in December of 2024. And when I read the article, I thought to myself, I'm wondering what is going to be new. You know, what's going to be new about this particular version of Linux Mint? And there's going to be a new default cinnamon theme, which is going to be much darker, which I like. There's going to be a contrasted design with rounded elements and improved dialogues. The update will include a redesigned force quit dialogue. It's going to be based on Ubuntu 2404. So it's going to get the Linux, the kernel 6.8, uh, which will have support until 2029. The Cinnamon desktop is, as you know, I'm wondering if this is in response to Cosmic. In my head, I was thinking to myself, how is it that other, how are other desktop uh, environment maintainers changing at all based on what they've seen in Cosmic that is now in, in Alpha 2? What do you What do you think, Matt? Do you think there's... I would. I don't know about changing so much as borrowing from. So I, I, I don't know if we talked about this when we talked about Cosmic, but matter of fact, I don't think we did. I think that once Cosmic is stable, th play because the the Mint guys are very anti Lib Adewita, right? Or however yeah. the hell you say it, right? And they, they just do not want to go follow the Gnome guys in that direction. They want to be able to do their own theming and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see in response to Cosmic if they do take some of the Cosmic stuff and put it inside of Mint. It would be – because I don't know if they'll, they'll do that because they do like to have control of their own stuff. But it's possible because – Cosmic is doing their own like theming and stuff that some of that stuff or at least they try to emulate that kind of stuff inside of Cosmic. It'd be interesting. I don't think though that this here would be in response to Cosmic, but I might be wrong because the rounded corners and the different design, maybe they yeah. got inspired to put a little bit more effort into the, the actual design because usually what they do is they come out with some extraneous app like i think the last time they redid the the the, the, the sticky notes app or something i don't know it was something like that I mean, they, they, they they redo an application of some kind and that's what the big feature is for a release this time it seems like they spent a lot more time on cinnamon because last few I, mean, I might be wrong about this because i'm not a cinnamon user but it feels like the last few versions of cinnamon have been pretty just you know meh yeah no i agree with you i think that it's you know, I, I like the fact that they're using a darker like default. I think that that's got potential. But I mean, I mean, you're going to have to be more innovative, I guess, is my my thought. You know, that was kind of my thinking in terms of how how Cosmic is actually changing the landscape of these other desktop environments. Are they be, are they do they feel pressure, I guess, is the question about being more innovative and focusing on. Productive, you know, productivity and performance and 
because I know that that's what Cosmic is kind of priding itself on, you know, especially with the the modern UI and the tiling management and integration, optimization rather. So, I, you know, I think, I listen, I always thought that competition is good. I mean, I coached soccer for a, a number of years. Competition is good, you know, when it comes right down to it. It forces everybody to up their game. And I'm just hoping that this is maybe the first step in these and in, in pushing other desktop environments to kind of like, okay, we're going to have to like step up our game here, you know, because Cosmic is, is looking kind of saucy. I, I agree with, I always, I'm going to agree with co- that com- competition is better. I wonder though, if they actually consider themselves competition, because what I'd be more interested in is if it's, do you think that there'd be a Cosmic version of Linux Mint? Like Mate seems to be pretty well dead at this point. Like it just feels kind of like, they're not real. I mean, yeah, they they have a plan for Waylon, but since Wimpress left, it doesn't. Or I think I think he left, uh, you know, or at least since he became less involved in the project, you should say. You know, it doesn't feel like it's at the forefront of innovation like it once was. I, I've this is just off the top of my head. It wouldn't surprise me if something like Cosmic replaced Mate in their lineup because they do still do three different versions of uh, of of Linux Mint. So, I mean. What do you yeah. think? Do you think it's going to be based like on whatever Ubuntu is doing, right? I mean, that's what that's. I mean, unless they're unless they're really they're going to be focusing more on the Debian edition, and if, and if that's the case, then they actually have a little bit more flexibility with regard to using Wayland because Cosmic doesn't have, you know, Cosmic doesn't have an XORG. You know, you have you absolutely have to make sure that you're providing, you know, and and I don't know what the uh, what the plan is for Cinnamon in adopting Wayland as it's, you know, I, I don't know. I have they have no an idea. experimental version of it right now. Okay. From what I've been told, it's better than it was when it first came out, but it's not ready yet. It's further I don't along. I any than of them are. I mean, XF, look at FC, XFCE. I mean, they're, I mean, because they're really, because they're, their maintainer is like one guy, you know, it's like he's got, he's got all this stuff to do. Uh, for XFCE, it's taken him some time, but at the same, I'm glad he's even working on it. Let's put it that way. I'm glad that he's like got a plan to incorporate Wayland or have Wayland part of XFCE because that would be a tragedy at some point if we would lose that. That would just be awful. I agree. I don't know that I'd use. I mean, glad I am glad that it's happening, but I'm more shocked that it's happening. I'm super, maybe not so shocked that it's happening, but shocked that it happened so soon. I would I would have when it, that news was announced for XFC I I thought that it was kind of like yes yeah, just never like why is this happening now Wayland isn't ready for problem let's say Re- Wayland is ready for seventy percent of the people who use Linux just pull that number out of my ass I figured that it, that number would have to be closer to a hundred percent before XFC would ever even consider it because usually I mean XFC doesn't ever pull stuff from that's new like it's it's, it's not an adoption adopter of new features <laughs> it goes completely against what xfc is so i don't know the the cosmic thing is very interesting to me as we talked about just because of the potential you you talked about it a lot in the episode but the potential it has to disrupt you know the desktop ecosystem but also I, I think you just brought it up here, like when, with your question, it has the potential to invigorate others. And I don't know so much about competition, but people see it and like say, hey, that's a good idea. Let's do something like that. See what we can do. Kind of iterate I think it's on compelling it. to these other to these other maintainers. It's like, OK, we need to innovate and adapt just like these guys are or, you know, because we because we should. I mean, that's I guess that's the, the thing. It's like maybe competition is not the purest idea for for these desktop environments or these maintainers but being there they want to innovate they want to adapt they want to make their stuff better and i think that that's i feel like i've talked a little bit too much about cosmic on a linux mint article but at the same time i that was my qu- thought was how is how is some how is that putting pressure on linux mint and cinnamon so there you go yeah all right so yeah, I don't think that it was wrong to talk about Cosmic because Cosmic is going to be the new player in in town. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. And 
I, what I need is a producer so that I can, you know, uh, <laughs> have someone else change to the scenes and, and I can be paying attention to what I'm supposed to be doing here, but I don't. So the next one I, I will be one of mine. We'll talk about, I actually don't even know which one. Let's go ahead and do Manjaro next. Okay, so this one is actually fairly old. It's from back in August, but we didn't talk about it on the podcast. So Manjaro is considering experimenting, it is, it has started experimenting with an immutable offering. And I, I wanted to talk about this first because Manjaro seems to uh, do this quite often with some things. They get fascinated with something and then just you never hear about it again they, they were going to do a gaming version of manjaro for a little while that never did it did anything they they, they did eventually bring out like a a, a non-stable version which is closer to arch they did eventually do that which they talked about forever so it's interesting to me that it's manjaro of all this of all distros that's doing this not surprising but just that it is and also it'd be interesting to see because they don't have the manpower that Valve has. Valve did Immutable Arch, and they obviously done it right. It's interesting, and we'll talk more about Arch later, but it's interesting to me that Manjaro is even really considering adding more to their plate, and it just, I don't know, it's one of those things where it doesn't really mesh to me. It never really has. Immutable and Arch together. I mean, it, that's why it was surprising when Valve did it, so... I think that this is actually a smart move in terms of experimenting with an immutable offering could be a significant step toward stability and reliability. And those are two things that I never thought I would say about Mancharo, honestly. You know, when it comes right down to it, I have, I have had a very poor opinion of them. And if they can increase their stability, in an immutable system, reducing the likelihood of breakages and package updates or misconfiguration, making it more stable for their users, uh, uh, and invariably would have easier rollbacks, better security. It would simplify their maintenance and they would have a more consistent like distro on their hands. I cannot, this is a very good idea for them. I, I'm I'm convinced of that because I, I mean, okay, granted, I'm a Debian user. I'm all about stability. I'm all about security. All right. But, I, and that's one of the reasons why I don't use Arch or an Arch-based system. It, okay. I, and don't put words in my mouth that say, I think that Arch is terrible or anything. I don't, because that's just not true. All right. It's just, I prefer Debian and how stable it is. That's that's the bottom line. And if you had an immutable, like what Manjaro is suggesting for Arch, that might make me interested in that. I'll just put that out there. Okay, so you made me think of something. So one of the interesting things here is that Manjaro, now it's not 100% the case, but people say that it is. Man, when Manjaro came out, one of the reasons why it existed was because it was going to be an easier version of Arch. Arch wasn't easy to install. Arch installed didn't exist yet. And the Calamaris wasn't around because Manjaro created... I think Manjaro was behind Calamaris. I might be wrong about that. But they weren't... You know, they came around, out around the same time either way. And Manjaro's purpose for existing was to not only be an easier to install version of Arch, but to be able to manage Arch in a more stable environment because all of the packages are delayed. The AUR is disabled by default. It's supposed to be Arch, but more stable, right? With the immutable thing, not so much that I think that, you know, immutable is like, sure, I think it's real, the really cool ideas and stuff like that, but I think in, instead of from, from a Manjaro point of view, it gives them a reason to exist where that kind of went away when Arch became easier to install and manage and more stable on its own, right? Nowadays, you can just go install Arch. Also, there at one point, Manjaro was the game when it came to Arch-based distros. Nowadays, you know, there's catchy OS, crunchy OS or whatever it's called, I don't even know. You know, there's Arco. There, there's just 10 million different Arch-based reposit, Arch-based distros out there, and Manjaro is no longer the special, awesome kid on the block. It's just, it's kind of become an also ran. It's, it's also become a, a joke to a lot of people because it's not great, right? So, or you know, they, you know, they've had so many missteps and stuff in the past. So, the ability to kind of 
if this were to succeed and kind of become the main thing that Manjaro does, to be able to market it as one of the first arch-based immutable or atomic or com composable distros out there, whatever you want to call it, whatever they're branding this nonsense these days, you know, they keep changing the damn name. That's the reason why I call it immutable. You know, people in the comments are talking about semantics again. I don't know, but whatever. You know, if, if this could be the main thing, I know thing what you that, mean. So <laughs> yeah, like, like what do you call? I mean, they change the name every five and a half months. I don't know. Once they settle on an actual name for what this nonsense is, I'll, 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 I'll be able to call it what it's supposed to be. I don't know. But anyways, if this is the like the main thing that Manjaro does, I could see that this becoming a play for them to become relevant again, and that's. I think that that's. Important because I mean, it is still a big distro that people do somewhat enjoy. I I've never cared for it all that much, but I, I have ethical problems with their developers, so that, that's more of a me problem than anything else. I I yeah I I'm just agreeing. I think that um, the thing that might be interesting is if you have a more an immutable that is based on stability and security, is the community going to adopt it though? I, that's the question for me is because there's the community that prefers an arch or an arch based. Are they going to want an immutable distro? I, it's a question I don't, I don't have an answer to, you know, for me as a Debian user, that might be some, like I said, I would be interested in something that had that kind of form. Well, I think one of the problems, so we, I don't know if we've talked about this in the podcast, Drew, but one of the problems with Immutable is what we just went through like a few seconds ago. They don't even know what to call it first. Yeah. So that, like, is it Immutable? Is it Atomic? Is it Composable? I've talked about this. We, we, I don't know if you were there on that lug or not, but George Castro joined a lug a couple months ago, and we, yeah. we talked about this, right? Like, like they keep calling it something different. Immutable is supposed to be like a read-only file system. It does do these things have that uh, also that it now it's supposed to be like you know how it's updated it's updated in the background so it's kind of automatic it's you know, all, it's, it's that stuff i i think in this and this isn't having to do with the manjaro way of doing things it's just until you can tell me exactly what this is and i'm going to talk more about this in my bluefin review but until you can tell me exactly what this is why it's good for me it's not going to be something that many people are interested in. And that's not saying that it's bad. None of the, like, Bluefin's fantastic. It's, it's very stable. You never have to mess with updates. A lot of stuff works on it. It's just really, really good. But it does work differently than Linux traditionally does. And until they can brand themselves in such a way that it, you know, it, you know, it makes sense to regular people. Like, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to developers, but if developers your audience, then why are you bothering me with it? You know, because I'm not a developer. If it's if it's supposed to be for regular everyday people, you have to have a, a message of why this way is good. And to your point, how do you get the community on board? That means you have to have something that draws that community in. Like this is why Immutable Manjaro is better than regular Manjaro. This is why you should use it. And Immutables in general haven't been able to do that. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Matt just said it as well as could be said. There you that's, go. That there you go. All right. Anyways, the uh, next one, Drew. Okay, so I have on my list a TechSpot article that says Valve is pouring money into Arch Linux to further improve Steam gaming. I selected this one. <laughs> Not being a gamer. Okay, just putting that out there. <laughs> not an arch guy. Not, a, not, not a an gamer. arch guy. Not a gamer. To me, the, the interesting part of this is why one company invests into in a distro like this. Okay, so that's the reason. I don't really, I don't care about the gaming one little bit. I'm just saying, why would they pour money into Arch to further improve Steam gaming? And the collaboration is a significant step enhancing open source gaming ecosystem, okay? Providing funding for a build service um, and secure signing enclave or whatever it's called. Uh, Valve aims to address key challenges that the Arch community faces, thereby streamlining development. The money will 
the financial support will have specific developers focus on crucial projects like the build service infrastructure and it will allow long-term sustain sustainability for uh for gaming on arch so i think this is a i think that they're what they're trying to do is maintain their their reason for using arch by pouring money into it you know they've put they've invested money or they invested time and effort into using arch for steam and they don't want that to go away they want that to succeed so that's why they're putting more and more money into it. Does that make sense? I, I I'm not good with this this topic actually, but yeah, that makes okay. sense to me as a one business investing in another business. It's yeah, I, I also think that it, part of it is that um, I, I, so more more why they chose Arch to use Arch in the first place. In, in a lot of ways, Arch is the least corporate distro, except for maybe like Gen two or something. And even Gentoo like has a lot of investment from Google because Google uses it for Chrome OS, right? So a lot of, a lot of Gentoo, I don't know about a lot of, but some Gentoo contribution comes from Google because of Chrome OS. Debian has a lot of corporate sponsors and is used widespread in the enterprise already. Obviously, Ubuntu and Red Hat and Suze and stuff are their corporate distros. So they have a lot. Of, even the other community community based distros have a lot of pre-existing corporate influence built in we talked about this in a you know last week or week before or whatever yeah um, when we we're talking about actually it was on the lug it was on the lug yep yeah so the corporate inf I, I think that one of the reasons why valve chose arch is because it's one of the few distros that didn't have pre-existing influence from another corporation and they were able to come in and be the corporate influence for arch they kind of adopted it and, and while, yeah, I'm sure companies have in the past in, invested in Arch, not so much as the others because it's known as a distro that's just not usable for anything in the enterprise. Like, you've never heard of an enterprise anywhere saying, oh, well, our Arch Linux server has to be upgraded every three and a half days because that's just the way Arch is, right? That'd be silly. So I, I think one of the reasons why they chose Arch is because they were able to come in and be the corporate influence. They have, don't have to worry about other companies coming in and influencing it because no other companies are really interested in it. And that's kind of led us to this point where they're actually putting you know, their money where their mouth is and, and that this is their corporate influence. And because they're a gaming company that's going to be focused on gaming, I think that's what it's all about. But more than that, I think that what you said as far as there and we talked about this before. There are basically two big building blocks: Debian and Arch. You know, there's just two big building blocks that are community-based distros out there. I don't know that they could do what they want to do with Debian in terms of its development cycle and stuff like that. Arch is much, much different when it comes to bleeding edge. You know, and so for them to be able to pivot quickly is a lot more. You know, it's like it's a lot easier on Arch. That's a fact, you know. So, yeah, I, I think that this is a smart move on Valve's part. I think that there's a definite need for them. I think it's kind of symbiotic that both of them could use the, that one could use the money and the other one could use the foundation for future growth for their for their company. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Uh, I'm Matt's messing around with workspaces again. So uh, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm trying to see what the next one is. Well, I, what I need, Drew, is about two more monitors and six more workspaces. That's what I need. Yours is about fair source. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that one next. All right. Let me see if I can't switch to it. Uh, give me just a second. I'm messing I'm completely messing. Oh, I, I'm I, sorry. I, you actually had two others. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I still have two more. We can do the, 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 the fair source one next. Uh, damn it. Still the wrong one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told you guys that it was going to be a mess for a minute while I, get, while I get this in there. All right, there we go. I finally made it to the right workspace. It only took me six tries. <laughs> okay, so yeah. So this article here is about how, I don't know, it, it feels more semantic to me than anything else because, but... I, that's not really true. Really, it's a fight over licensing, and the, the the licensing is always interesting to me for more nerdy reasons than functional reasons, if that makes sense. Like, at the end of the day, end users don't care anything about really about licensing. If someone says it's open source, 
that's enough for them. Nobody, no one who's ever, who, most people, I should say, haven't gone into a, a project or wanting to use a project saying, you know, oh, this uses the MIT license, therefore it's okay. Or this uses the GPL 3.0. I prefer the 2.0. You know, most people aren't looking at the licensing stuff, that thing from a consumer standpoint. But to companies, this matters a lot. And a lot of a lot of the stuff here, how they're talking about who gets to use the source code, how it's contributed to, how it's owned after people you know move on, and stuff. And open source. I and I don't know if this is part of the the article or not. This has been a, a week since I read this, but the part of the problem with open source is it it has become an umbrella for. A lot of different licenses, a lot of different ways of doing things that are open source, and also it's I mean because of the open source conglomeration or open source board, there's a there's a foundation because of course there is that does open source stuff. It determines whether or not something is open source enough to be called open source. I don't remember what the name is. I'm sure Travitan will tell me in the in the chat, but. They're notoriously not well regarded. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with a, 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 an okay way of saying it. So by having something else, they got issues. <laughs> they have they have issues, right? It's become political because everything becomes political, and a lot of companies don't want to have to deal with that. Also, because of how, wanting to have more control over the code itself while still remaining somewhat open, they've come up with this thing called fair source. And it's more of a startup thing. I, it, it's interesting in that what we needed a is more licensing jargon, jargon. But also, I think that some of this stems off from the idea that open source has just become too big of a umbrella for everything, and it just doesn't work the way that companies want it to always work. And I think that's I think, ba- go ahead. Yeah. No, I was gonna say I think that there's like this is like the, the, this is the middle ground. You know, fair source is basically middle ground, okay? Whereas I don't want to necessarily be like pigeonholed as closed source because that does that fosters no community support, okay, for for certain people. And then it's not clearly not open source. So I think there's there's a growing desire for companies to balance the benefits of open source software with the need for some level of control in a closed source. And when I really thought about it, man, I was thinking, huh, I think Vivaldi kind of falls into that category. When it comes right down to it, they're an op- they have open source aspects to their code and they also have closed source. So for them, for you know, if you want to make people think that you have a desire to work with the open source community, you kind of fall into that, you want to fall into that middle ground where it's kind of like you have a fair source license. That way you're saying, okay, guys, here's all this code, this open source code that you can like work on and here it is, but we are going to kind of keep this one to ourselves over here just to keep watchful eye. It's it, this we need to really focus on. And so, so I, I think that's kind of like where it kind of falls in between you know, it, where it's not necessarily open and it's not necessarily closed. It just in the middle. And it's, it makes, you know, companies are, gonna, are, are trying to use a better word than closed source. You know, that's the fact. Yeah. Well, I, I should go ahead and read this part here. It says, so in order to be considered fair source, it should be publicly available to read. So this would be what, what they call it. What It's called source available. So a lot of, a lot of, Projects will make their source available, but they're not open source. So this should, be, so it should be public available to read. It should be allowed to use for use, modification, and redistribution with minimal restrictions to pro, to protect the pro, the producer's business model, and it should undergo delayed open source publication. So it, it's you're you're right. It's basically what this is is a middle ground towards the point to be more to still be somewhat open about their co- code, but while still protecting their ability to basically make money and have some control over the code itself you know and i think that w- one of the things that spawned this along with the and Trafferton did say it's the software freedom conservative conservancy some of the stuff that's going on along with being labeled open source over the course of the last 20 years or whatever 
has come down to companies take something that's really awesome that's open source, make it their own, make it proprietary, and then never talk about the the base version of the project ever again. Amazon has done this several times with a database that they call, I don't know what the name of it is, because I'm horrible with names, everybody knows that. And several other companies have just come along and basically yoinked open source code and made it their own, never contributed back. That's what this whole WordPress thing is going on right now. Have you heard about this, Drew, with the, the WordPress thing? Very, very little, but... I'd be interested in what you... So basically what what's happening is that there's a company called WP Engine out there that uses the open source version of WordPress to basically do their entire business. And they've just taken it and have contributed very little back to the open source project. And the guy who who is in charge of Automatic, who does all of the WordPress stuff, both, both the... WordPress.com and WordPress.org stuff had, had came out and basically said, hey, this isn't okay. You can no longer take the open source stuff that we provide most of the contributions to and then never give anything back, right? And that's basically what this all, all it, the, the WordPress stuff is all surrounded about be, someone taking open source stuff, making a business and profitable business on it, and then never contributing back. There's no, Nobody's ever said, well, you can do that. It's just all about contribution back and adding value to the project, which is the way open source is supposed to work, but has proven to be hard to enforce. Like someone said in the chat, if you can't enforce your license, it's basically just scrap paper. You know, so I think that this fair source thing is something along the lines of trying to fix that problem. But people still have to follow your license in order to, you know, for it to actually have teeth. And you actually have to be able to say, you know, if, if you don't follow the license, we're going to take you to court. You know, we're going to sue you for, for all of your money. And the reason why the open source licenses haven't really, you know, worked all that well, you know, at least in practice when bad things happen regarding the licenses is because the vast majority of people who use them don't have the money to go sue Amazon for a trillion dollars to get to get them to actually contribute back or follow the license. I don't know that the fair source thing is going to fix that problem. It's interesting that it's come to this, and, and I, I'd be it's going to be fascinating to follow it along and see how well it does. I'm not convinced that it will work, but someone needed an idea, and this is probably the best one out there that I've seen. Yeah, cool. All right, next one. I have an, I read an article called on it was on its Foss. It was the title Next Cloud Hub Nine is an explosive release with decentral full decentralization and more automation. Now, while we were talking about uh, Next Cloud last week, I was like, oh wow, I'm doing an update, and then it was like, there's Next Cloud thirty all of a sudden, and it was like, holy smokes, this is really good. And when I thought about how good it was, I was a little like, I don't want to say mad or anything like that. But as I was looking at the comments on the on the podcast that we did last week, Matt, there was a lot of kind of pushback on Nextcloud. And it wasn't I mean, a lot. I don't want to say it. I'm overstating a little bit. All right. But there was a lot of people that did not have the same glowy kind of opinion that I have of Nextcloud. It was just kind of like, eh. It's okay, it, and or I just don't care for it or something. And I'm telling you what, I am like a shill for Nextcloud. And can, when it comes, go ahead. I'm I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Can we can we just talk about that for just one minute? Go back to that because you're right. Sure. There was some pushback. And the biggest thing that I want to mention is that s several people are saying, "Well, no, I'm not going to use Nextcloud. I'm just going to use Sync thing." I banged my my head against the wall. Those things aren't the same thing. No. The, they're just the you have to have two computers for sync thing to work. Like sync thing doesn't store anything. It just it's just a conduit for syncing something from one place to another. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm really sorry I interrupted Drew, but that just no pissed no. Me. It really I, pissed I was me off. One of this, yeah, I was like, but it wasn't just that one. There was more than that that I was just like, I'm I'm surprised because uh, and I I I understand too. There's such a like I don't know the development cycle has really gone fast with Nextcloud. So maybe. You saw it like two years ago, and it's nothing like it is now. So if you may have, maybe have had that like bad taste in your mouth maybe a couple of years ago, and you're just like, eh, this isn't for me. Even you, Matt, you were kind of like, 
on the fence for a, quite a while, actually, right? The UI kept me from going in there because I didn't care for the UI, no, right? No. And, and and it's it, like we talked about last week. It's kind of like Emacs. It has all these features. Like oh, I don't know, I don't really need all that stuff. But and, and there's nothing wrong with like we never said last week, Drew, that you know you have to use Nextcloud. No. Like it's the only thing in the world, right? But the the, the Things that I heard saw in the comments there were, were like, "Oh, it, you know, it, it's this and this, and and the the sync thing 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 was just whatever." And I I think Nextcloud is one of those things where you're never going to use all the features. Like you're just not going to. Like chances are, like you're not going to go in there. And you're not going to install every application that's available. You're not going to go and use everything that's by, by default. You might not even install. Like you don't even have to install. Like if you don't want to talk, you don't have to install it. Like you can or you can uninstall it if you want to. Right, you can do whatever you want with that stuff, and I think that Nextcloud is one of those things where you kind of have to have a use for it. But once you find one use for it, you find twelve. You know, like I think that's kind of what we talked about last week. Like we both use it for, for file tra- file storage and and backup and stuff like that. And then oh, oh look, look, that application is really cool. That application is really cool. And all of a sudden, you have you know twelve different applications that you're using it for, and I think until you experience that, you know, you're in this position where a lot of the people in that comment section were like, oh, I just don't really, you know, like it or so. And there was there's someone in there that said, like, oh, I don't really care for how they do the development work. Uh, and someone was talking about how someone got into like an AI fight or something like that. I was like, eh, yeah. I mean, AI is going to be the next thing you're just going to have to deal with. It. Anyways, <laughs> we Go ahead and, and uh, talk about. No, I was uh, no. I, I, you kind of hit on a lot of the points that I was going to make. You know, the fact is, I, and I think that one of the th- com- <laughs> I want to go back to the comments again, but somebody also said that Nextcloud is like the darling of the YouTuber. You know, something or something similar to that. And I mean, I wa- I watched I watched Tech Hut, and he said, you know, look, hey, look at uh, Nextcloud Nine, and you know. Nextcloud Hub 9 and it blah, blah, blah. It is the Google killer when it comes right down to it. You know, Google Docs and so on and Google Drive. Listen, I'm not going to debate that. This is an open source project that I really, really respect. And in fact, I love this. I love this stuff, okay? The stuff that's interesting out of this particular improvement cycle is Nextcloud Flow. It's a new automation tool that integrates data from various sources to streamline tasks, such as managing payments or processing, like if you were to use this for your company, processing vacation requests. It's actually got the improved NextCloud Talk, so it's got complete federation there. It's got a new whiteboard application for brainstorming and diagramming during meetings, which is freaking nice. It's got the AI powered assistant now for, it's like a chat interface. Now I'm not going to use that. I'll be honest with you. I will not be using that anytime soon. But then there's also like integrations with XWiki for uh, NextCloud Talk. And and, and there's just so much in there. Granted, I am a shill and I (laughs) recognize that. Okay. But I wasn't kidding. At the beginning of this podcast, I said, I've got a 45 minute video on NextCloud. I anticipate at least, well, at least one, if not two more videos after that. And it has, it has maybe a little bit of spite because of how the, how the pushback was in the comments for it. I just don't care. I want to, to promote Nextcloud because I think it's freaking awesome. And that's just who I am. <laughs> you know? So nanny, nanny, boo-boo. It's all I can say. One thing I will say though, is because I use the Docker, I got that automatically. Like, I didn't even have to update. It was awesome. Like one, just one time I went to, so I, along, I showed you earlier how I have all my bookmarks there at the bottom, Drew. And one of those is Nextcloud. And it used to be this little circle thing. And now all of a sudden it's square. I was like, what is that icon? It wasn't there yesterday. Like I clicked on it. I was like, oh, I have Nextcloud 9 now. It's awesome. I haven't done much exploring in there because like I talked about last week, I don't use the web interface as much as I probably should. And I, I used it more in the last week than a lot before because I've been installing every application you told me about last week. <laughs> I'm a little obsessed too. It's it's awesome. But the the new features, so we should do, I think we've actually talked about AI on the podcast a couple few times before. I don't know if it was before you joined Drew, but we probably should do another whole episode on AI because the way open source is implementing AI is both good and bad. Like, 
they're definitely relying a lot on the existing AI infrastructure. You don't see a lot of companies coming out with their own AI and doing their own data collection and all that stuff. They're relying on existing architectures. Now, that's not under all across the board. There's things like Whisper or whatever that they are doing their own language models and stuff. But and, and that's not so good. But also, I do like that it's much more cautious than I thought it was going to be. Like, I thought... When AI became this big deal, you'd have a whole bunch of people coming out and putting AI into every open source project. And that really hasn't been the case. Like even Firefox, which is always gung-ho on the latest new shiny thing, has been somewhat cautious in bringing it to Firefox. I thought it would be here by now, but it's not. That They've been rolling out and testing how they want to do it, which I think is smart and it makes me happy because it, I'm not a big fan of AI. I don't the privacy impl implications and all that stuff, I and mean, we can talk about it in another pod, but all, all that stuff is absolutely 100% legitimate, but you can't deny that it's going to happen whether we like it or not. So how open source adapts to that new thing is going to be very interesting coming forward. And Nextcloud is going to be a big thing in that because they're going to, they, they have the AI assistance, the, the flow thing and stuff. All this stuff is going to, encroach upon that area of artificial intelligence or large language models and data collection and stuff, how they do that is going to be very interesting going forward because it is open source. And one of their things about being open source is it's, it's a hundred percent self hosted open source. You know, I'm, I'm actually having a fight with someone in the comments of my self hosted video about whether or not Plex is open source or not open source, whether or not Plex is self hosted or not. And I'm like, yeah, Plex is self-hosted. I do. I, I host Plex. It's on my server. Like, it's there. It had all the bits are there. Yes, it's proprietary bits. And yes, I do have to sign in with a, you know, a Plex account. But all, it's all, you know, I, I don't know. It's a stupid fight. But it, it all plays into this. Like, with the way Nextcloud works, it'll be interesting to see how um, they balance the need for gaining a whole bunch of, of data in order to make AI work and, you know, maintaining their privacy focused suite of tools. You know what I mean? Yep. Also, I really wish they'd just lower the radius of the corners. Like, do we have to wait till next cloud 10? Can, can, can we, can we talk about this in like, I don't know, five or 10 minutes because I have something for you. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Let's do it. Well, no, it was, it's going to be my nuggie of the week. Oh, basically. okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's fine. All right, we got one more to go. I think, uh, what is this, Rockstar, I think? That, yeah. That's, uh... The GTA? Yeah. We made it to the last one, and I finally got the whole workflow for switching workspace down. It only took me six articles to do. All right, so this was probably the biggest news of the last two or three weeks. Rockstar, who is the, the developer of GTA and Red Dead Redemption and in several other games, they're a multi billion dollar company right like they make a ton of money and they sell you these 80 dollar games but also they have online versions of these games and for the longest time since the steam deck came out basically gta 5 and specifically which is their biggest brand has worked on the steam deck has been certified to work on the steam deck now it always had some warnings like oh the text is too small or whatever but you could go on there and play gta online and it would work fine well a couple weeks ago Rockstar decided they didn't want to do that anymore. And this fired up every Linux YouTuber out there. I don't think DT did one, but I'm pretty sure like Brody did one. And we saw Gardner Bryan or whatever his name is. He talked about this and it was a big deal. And the idea here is that they didn't want to, or they basically are saying that the Steam Deck and specifically Linux doesn't support their version of anti-cheat which is obviously a lie because it did actually for anti-cheat up until now. And the anti-cheat specifically that it uses, Steam has made available via a very easy switch, apparently. I don't know anything about how easy it actually is, but they say it's very easy. All you have to do is apparently send them an email and it's available to them. I don't know how accurate that is, but I've, I've read it online, so it has to be true. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea is that the, you know, it was very, very easy for them to use anti-cheat on Linux, but they decided that they didn't want to do it, and then they basically shut themselves off from 
any communication with the community or with Valve on this subject and just pointed all support requests to Valve. And that was the end of it. Just now all of a sudden GTA 5 Online doesn't work. Now you can still play the single player and, you know, that that's really what I cared about anyways because the online was just... I didn't play GTA to do online. I'd get my ass kicked by all the teeny boppers. But it was a big deal for a lot of people because they spent you know money on this game to play it on their Steam Deck online. And now all of a sudden it no longer works. So there you yeah. go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much I can contribute on a game thing. Other than, uh, I mean, it's actually a, as far as the um, mon- the money is concerned, does does that do you think that it could possibly affect sales for the Steam Deck because of these issues? I mean, because that's a big deal. I mean, money. I don't. I don't think so. First off, I, I think because the Steam Deck has been around for so long, the the yeah. the pressure to buy one is basically everyone who wants one probably already has one. The and you know if that's not true, the sales have probably slowed down quite a bit. But I also, so. also I think that the problem of anti-cheat has been around with the Steam Deck since its beginning. There are a lot of games that just don't work on on the Steam Deck because of anti-cheat, because they require anti-cheat that only works on Windows, and there's no way to emulate it, or they haven't transitioned over to Linux, or they just haven't wanted to, or whatever the reason, right? Like, for example, Destiny 2 is a big one. It could, it uses anti-cheat that does work on Linux, but... They just decided they didn't want to because a lot of they don't want to support Linux users, right? Because when even though Linux users are a very small portion of would be a very small portion of their audience, they say a vast majority of their support requests would come from Linux users because of the way Linux works. I don't know if that's still true or not, but they think that it's true, so therefore they haven't made it available on Linux. And that's a lot of the problem with the Epic stuff as well because of, they just don't want to have to support Linux. And that that's really their thing. And I'm wondering if that didn't have a thing to play with it. Like maybe they were getting a lot of support requests from Linux users and they just decided they didn't want to do that anymore. That's a possibility. Also, maybe they just didn't want to, or maybe there was a, some kind of back and forth beef between Valve and, and Rockstar that we don't know about in the background. Who knows? I, I think that if Valve were a bigger company, they could throw money at this problem. Like, like, yeah, they make a lot of money, but they're not a big company. They have like 50 employees. They're still privately run. They're not, they're not, they don't have uh, all the investor stuff that's coming in because of their a public company. So they don't have a ton of cash that they can just, is, there's a reason why they only do one hardware thing at a time. You know, that's because they're small. If they were like Microsoft, Microsoft could just say, you know, screw it. We're going to buy Rockstar. <laughs> like, like, I'm surprised they haven't already. You know, they, they could do that, but they don't, they just don't have that kind of resources. So I, I think that that's where this is kind of, I, I think that might be Valve's biggest problem when it comes to gaming is they don't have the resources of Sony or Microsoft to throw at this kind of stuff when it happens. I don't know. It was interesting to me mostly because, not because it would affect new buyers, but because it would affect people who already bought it. It's like, I, I didn't, I bought it to play on Linux, but I never bought it to play online, so it doesn't really affect me all that much. But I know a lot of people do. Here's something weird that happens, Drew. So because GTA is online, there's no really real story there. People get on Twitch and roleplay through GTA 5. It's really, really freaking weird. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's just the weirdest thing ever. And it's very entertaining because they come up with their own... It's like watching a... A uh, pimps and hoes and cops and shit version of D- Dungeons and Dragons. It's really, really weird. <laughs> I don't know. But if you want to use that on Linux now, you can't because uh, they say no. So there you go. I did uh, want to say I think that um, Valve is a little bit bigger I, before we get people saying Valve is bigger. Yeah, I think they've got like three to 400 employees. Oh, do they? Point, I, th- I thought they yeah. were smaller than that. But still... When you consider uh, Mozilla has seven thousand five hundred. Oh my god! Yeah, I mean it's still on the smallish side, but it's not fifty. As small as I thought. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to the last part of the podcast, which we call affectionately, in or not so affectionately. You want? Here's a threat. Hey Tyler, you want me to keep continue calling this Nuggies? Show up to the show up to the damn podcast. (laughs) Anyways, yeah. Anyways, it's the Nuggies of the week. These are our picks, our tricks, or or whatever you want to call them of the week. Things that we're interested in that we want to share with you guys. So Drew, 
take us away. What do you got? I am going to make you incredibly happy with a Nextcloud app that you can install, Matt, that is titled Unrounded Corners. Oh, God. I know. I'm going to do this right now. I have every... (laughs) I was I was waiting all week for this, Matt. I was just like, Matt is going to love this unrounded corners. So if you want to pimp out your UI just a little bit, you don't like the rounded corners, uh, there is an application that will eliminate those rounded corners in your Nextcloud instance and make it look more box-like. It's, uh, it's very, very nice. So. Okay. So did Nextcloud 9 fix search? From the silence, I'm going to say no. We're, 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 I don't know. I didn't even, I didn't, I didn't look. I found it, I, I, you know, by chance type thing. And I was just like, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. I, I am going to share my, my, new, my screen with you when we're done with this podcast, because I think that it's just like, holy smokes, this is what, this is what Nextcloud can achieve. And that's the reason why not, am I, not only am I going to be doing this installation video, but I'm going to be doing other videos associated with Nextcloud. And like it or lump it, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm def- once I'm able to find that application, I'm definitely using it. Okay. <laughs> you, I wonder if you can actually just provide me a link to that later on. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can. I'll see if All I right. can. Yeah. Okay. That, that sounds awesome because that's, that's by far the worst part of the, the UI. Okay. So my nuggie of the week is, it's a good question. What is my nuggie of the week? I've totally forgotten. Oh, I it's didn't a, even have one until about five minutes ago. <laughs> okay. So mine is one that I don't know where it came from. So I can't share the source. So whoever created this, I apologize. I stole it about three years ago and I didn't write down who I got it from. It's called i3 window title. And if you want it, it's in my scripts folder on my GitLab. And I don't have any instructions on how to use it yet, so it does require some knowledge on how to do that. I'll write that up eventually. So this nuggie is going to be basically useless but in, until I get that done because it does require some finagling. But basically what it does is it allows you to put the icon of the application that you're using in Polybar while using i3. It's impossible to do otherwise, okay? And it's finicky in that you have to have an OPL file. Actually, it might be YAML. It's some file in your configuration folder or directory that will basically assign icons to... Hey, stop that. Sorry, dog's chewing. (laughs) I told you it was going to happen. Anyway, you have to have a file in there that basically defines an icon for every application that you're going to use. So it's a little finicky. It's not automatic. But if you're interested in theming your polybar and using X win- the X-Window module where it will show the title of the thing, but you also want to be able to put an icon up there, i3 window title will allow you to do that. And like I said, it's in my scripts folder. Someone shared it with me on Reddit ages ago. It is a, it's a re-implementation of something that is for BSPWM. I will try to find links to all this stuff and put them in the show notes so you can actually, so I can actually give credit to whoever did this because this was not me. And I'll also put all the information on how to use it somewhere up on my GitLab so you can find it. So anyways, that's my nuggie of the week. It is, it's not useful. It's just cool. Anyways, that's it for this one. Uh, and uh, my dog uh, needs to go outdoors. So you're just going to have to wait just a second, buddy. We're going to have to finish this up. Okay. Anyways, that's it for this one. Uh, and I just did my entire nuggy showing only Drew's face. <laughs> In my defense, the dog won't stop, won't leave me alone. Okay, hi. Any, <laughs> anyways, that's it for this one. If you want to get in contact with me, maybe you have a better way of controlling OBS scenes than what I do, so that I can quit forgetting to switch them back and forth. You can email us at email at the linuxcast.org. That's the best way to get in contact with us. If you want to watch us live, which is what I usually say before the contact information, you can do so. We do this every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube.com slash the Linux cast. We talk about Linuxy stuff just like we do this time. We don't always do the news. So if you want to watch us live, we have a lot of fun with people in the in the chat room. It's awesome and we have a good time. But if you don't catch us live, we do post this on every conceivable platform that you could you could think of other than PeerTube, which is still broken for me. But it's on Odyssey. If you want to listen to the audio version, you can get it on your favorite podcatcher, the Edited versions that are not live obviously come out every 
Saturday evening thereabouts. So you can catch it afterwards. If you want to get in contact with Drew or watch all of Drew's content, which I highly recommend you do because he has that next cloud video that he's promised this will come out and is already done, and that's going to be awesome. He's at youtube.com slash justaguylinux. He posts things on, obviously, Nextcloud, Window Managers, Debian. Like I talked about earlier, he does Debian installs. I miss those, Drew. I need those <laughs> back ASAP. <laughs> Anyways, you, youtube.com. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, that'd be awesome. Just you and your, your clickety-clackety keyboard installing Debian the hardest way possible. Anyways... The you can go to youtube.com slash just a guy Linux to c- catch all of his stuff there. If you want to get in contact with us in any other way, you, you can find all of our contact information at the linuxcast.org slash contact. That's where all of the links to like the, the Discord and the Matrix server, which does still exist. I don't know if anybody uses it. I haven't been there in over a year. You can find links to all of our social stuff, including Mastodon, Drew's Mastodon, all that stuff. Linuxcast.org slash contact. Anyways, that's it for this one. We'll see you next time.